So this is it, the end of the series. Throughout this video, we're going to be covering some complex and controversial philosophy, so I hope you'll join me in this deep dive. In this video, we'll be talking about the foundling, Hadern, and the hidden meaning within the subtext. Let's do a quick recap since it's been a while since my last upload. Fair warning, however, that if you haven't gotten a chance to watch my Shell Spotlight videos, I highly recommend pausing the video now to do so. They're in a more cinematic format, and I think I did a pretty good job conveying each storyline while still preserving the tension and drama of it all. So throughout this game, you're primarily exploring three different zones associated with three different cults. Let's talk about each cult briefly. One cult is the Deathless Doctrine that follows the Immaculate, an icy revered oak god that is associated with the past. It is also referred to as the most vulnerable of the unborn. Each of these cults carries associations and themes, and this one constantly references reminiscence. The Immolation is the fire-themed cult in the Sanctum of Flame, and it is associated with the present as well as the agony. Their revered is referred to as the hungriest of the unborn, who constantly requires sacrifice. The Eternal Narthex is an obsidian-themed cult in the Shifting Archives. They say their revered is paradoxically both born and unborn. They are commonly associated with oblivion and the future. So the association of elements with the religions is nothing new. In our own world, elements held a very special part of spirituality for a large segment of human history. The Greek pantheon had gods of each respective element. In Buddhism, the Mahabhuta literally means the four great elements, earth, water, fire, and air. All that to say, classical elementalism has real-world contexts. Perhaps the earliest known example comes from the Babylonian creation myth dated back to 1900 BCE. This creation myth was transcribed on stone tablets and is called the Enuma Elish. It talks about conflicting gods, each symbolizing specific elements. It's all very interesting and I highly suggest you look it up, but I wanted to draw specific attention to one particular aspect of the myth. On the creation of man, the text describes the beheading of a god and the mixing of that god's blood with the earth's soil whereupon the first man is born. So that brings me to my main point. Each of these gods and their specific elements are symbolic. Ice is cold and preserving, fire is cleansing but requires constant kindling, obsidian is the result of super hot magma cooling rapidly, it is oily and reflective and inert. So fire, ice, and obsidian. But what if I told you there was another god, a secret god, one that many people seem to miss? In Harris' story, he talks about a mother giving birth to a sallow-skinned creature emerging from the earth. Throughout his dialogue, we were given repeated imagery of mud and earth's viscera. The practitioners he meets are clothed in mud and bones. This god's element is earth. Throughout the game's lore, there is repeated mention of a truth. There is a false truth, there are mentions of lies. The inscription in the Shifting Archive reads, The truth is simple if you strip away all the extra VRs. And while it might seem confusing and perhaps disingenuous to suggest this game carries a deeper meaning, it is my belief that there is, in fact, a deeper truth here. So we have a mysterious god of earth and mud, but how does that help us decipher the truth? Well, let's turn to the aptly named Glimpse of Truth for answers. The glimpse of truth glows bright, grasped within the glimpse there are multitudes, their bodies thread together forming a single indivisible being without a name, this nameless formless creature speaks in all tongues, it speaks the bear's name, it is burgeoning and unraveling all at once. The vision grants more questions than answers. It is my belief that this glimpse refers directly to the foundling. For one, each glimpse is styled directly after the character it refers to. The glimpse of insignificance refers to the immaculate, and it's blue and icy. The glimpse of truth is a very similar color to the foundling and seems to describe the way in which it can control bodies that are threaded together in multitudes. The words burgeoning and unraveling here are very important. Let's start with burgeoning. Burgeoning means rapid growth, something the player does throughout the course of the game, growing more powerful as they accumulate more experience and glimpses. But it also has an archaic definition. The root of this word refers to a plant putting forth young shoots. A plant taking firm root in the earth and growing. This seems to align with the use of the word seedling found throughout various lore in the game. So we know that the foundling is referred to as the unborn, we know the revered are also referred to as unborn, which leads us to the conclusion that the foundling is a revered. This might explain his powers, his ability to harden, and his role in the game. 
At the start of the game, you emerge from a hole in the ground from the skeleton of a large creature that looks reminiscent to the other revered's locations. If you inspect your environment, you see practitioners hardened in stone and a scene that looks exactly as Harris describes. So Harris was sent to kill the foundling, but inevitably failed on his mission to kill a god. But there are a few things missing with this theory. In order to take the gland from the other revered, you have to find a guardian first. If the foundling is a revered, where is his guardian? In order to fight the guardian, you have to drink nectar, but there's no nectar where the foundling starts. The word seed appears again in this inscription. Their messiah planted his seeds and left. They seek a utopia which cannot exist, charmed and forgotten, choking on the nectar of false gods. How high and mighty will they be when they consume this poison? They sully their lips with false wine. It lulls their needs like a lover's caress. But what of their lives? What of their former devotions? Left behind like a sack with a hole, forgotten like the tar out of the night before. Liquid filth is their sacrament and will be their downfall. It's that which we've seen and that which we shall sow. These creatures, twisted and malformed, they're almost unrecognizable. Whatever gifts Hadern has lavished them with were wasted. They've strayed so far from the path, they're lost in a wilderness of their own making. These are three separate inscriptions I believe convey an overall complete dialogue. Each seems to allude to Tar being problematic, each seems to chide the followers of false gods, it describes a group of people who become unrecognizable due to their consumption of tar. There is a messiah who spontaneously vanishes after planting his seeds. In the Immaculate Faith, the first martyr could be considered a messiah because he sacrifices himself and his entire living memory in order to serve the Immaculate. But I believe this is actually referring to Hadern. Hadern is probably the most difficult to decipher character in this game, but he carries a huge role, occupying the realm we wake up in and being the one we need to defeat in order to acquire new weapons. Hadern doesn't occupy the normal game world like the other characters in this game do. The last inscription pertaining to Hadern's gifts is in the past tense. He no longer is lavishing them with gifts because he has planted his seeds and left. He has left to become a guardian. And that is why Hadern's role is so closely tied with that of the foundling. That is why he's the one who creates us upon birth, and that is why he can harden like we can. Hadern is the foundling's guardian in the same way that Tarsus is the Immaculate's. So if these inscriptions are to be believed, tar and nectar are harmful. But first, what is tar? It is literally the blood of the gods, harvested from the glands of the revered. But the description for nascent tar reads, Separated from pure nectar, this tar is still warm as if just extracted. The dark splotchy color shimmers with a liminal essence. Liminal is an interesting word here because liminality is a concept in anthropology within the context of religion. It describes the time during a rite of passage between the secular and the sacred. It is that moment just before transcendence, stuck just before a threshold. This ties back into the opening text at the start of the game. Beyond the grip of the familiar, a threshold demands to be crossed, the mortal shells yearn for meaning, awaiting a glimpse of their true purpose. So if Tar refers to transcendence, and the foundling is ultimately the one that ascends, why doesn't the foundling's chamber have any Tar? It is my belief that herein lies the true meaning behind the story of mortal shell. Tar is both the essence of, and the religion of, the various gods. By drinking the tar, the denizens of Falgrim are subscribing to that particular revered's religion. Tar is, as far as we've seen, crucial to the religious practices of each cult. People only receive tar when they observe particular religious rites. Mortal Shell is therefore effectively a story about nihilism. Hadern suggests that by drinking the tar and subscribing to religion, they are ushering in their downfall. Liquid filth is their sacrament and will be their downfall. It's that which we've seen and that which we shall sow. Sow is another word referring to planting seeds in the earth. The foundling, both burgeoning and unraveling, unravels the organized religions of Fulgrim and thus brings about his ascendance. But you might be asking, if Mortal Shell is a criticism of organized religion, why is the foundling a god? Well, let's consider the elements each cult represents. Of the four, mud is the most mundane. It also has the highest potential to support life. 
The earth is where we grow our crops, and it supports the trees that give us oxygen. It maintains primordial qualities, and it is where we come from. To quote the Bible, when God created Adam, he said, Remember you are dirt, and to dirt you shall return. In the life cycle, when someone dies, they decompose and become dirt, and that death supports the living until they inevitably die as well. All that to say, this element is the most natural and is most closely tied with death. Nihilism is probably one of the most misunderstood philosophies. Existential nihilism refers to the belief that life is intrinsically without purpose. While many people stop there, the implication is that the only purpose your life has is one that you yourself create. This is the existential in existential nihilism. This fundamentally contradicts most religion, since most of them ascribe existence to a deity or doctrine's predestination. While the secret baghead ending might seem like a simple joke, this actually plays into the theme. Both endings present a glimpse into how someone can live as a nihilist. When the foundling chooses to stay with Baghead, that choice has negative consequences as a result of his inaction. On the other hand, the true ending, where the foundling chooses to dismantle the cults, ultimately has the best outcome because he ascends. If life has no inherent purpose, your purpose is yours to make. The choice is still the foundling's, and still carries consequences. In spite of potentially sounding cliché, nihilist philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche said God is dead and we have killed him. This refers to the death of organized religion in the age of science and reason. But ultimately, we know this proclamation to be untrue. There are simply too many questions that science cannot answer. Science can't answer what happens when we die. Science can't magically undo the burden of a guilty conscience or promise an end to suffering. Throughout the Shell's stories, we're introduced to various motivations for joining these cults. There's a certain tranquility in doing so, an assuredness that the chaos of an unknowable reality simply doesn't have. Each religion promises various answers. The last line of the Glimpse of Truth states, The vision grants more questions than answers. Nihilism doesn't promise answers, unlike religion. It begs more questions. It frees the mind from the comforts of moral indoctrination. If you choose to be a good person, that basis for behavior is entirely your own. You are doing so of your own volition, not because you are promised to be rewarded for it. You are not promised an answer to death, you are left to question your place in the cosmos. Each of the three main cults within the game showcases the amount of suffering beset upon their practitioners. The fire cult literally flays themselves, the ice cult freezes its practitioners, while the obsidian cult has people throwing themselves into bottomless pits. On the other hand, nowhere in the game are we shown such torture from this mud cult. The practitioners of this mud cult are ever referenced as consuming tar, and the Hadern text would suggest that it's likely frowned upon. Compared to the three main areas with their grand cathedrals and sanctums, the place where we find the mother is incredibly mundane and natural. Which leads me to believe that the foundling more than likely symbolizes an ideology rather than a religion. Which might explain why, when doing a no shell run, you get the nihilist achievement. In Harris's final line of dialogue, when he is adopting the mud god's ideology, he states, What difference does it make, what master you serve, as we will all serve the same? Which seems to me to suggest an utter resignation to the pointlessness of organized faith. When you look at the description for the Ballista Zuka, you hear talk of the Neoterics of Miraden. This is relevant because Neoterics in the real world were a group of ancient Greek poets who deliberately turned away from classical Homeric epics and chose to write about the relatable mundane rather than the far-off feats of gods. So let's conclude. Mortal Shell is subtly a game about nihilism. The game pits the player in a constant struggle against three main cults. At the head of each cult is a revered who gives their practitioners tar in order to control them. The revered are protected by guardians. The foundling is a revered, and its guardian is Hadern, but it does not give any tar. That is because the foundling represents nihilism. Now let's go back to the Enuma Elish. 
it was only through the death of a god and the resulting blood that brought about the birth of man. It is my belief that this ties heavily into the story of Mortal Shell. It is only through the toppling of the religious hierarchy that the ascension occurs. Now, there are two big plot points that I think are worth mentioning. Firstly, the old prisoner calls forth the death of the gods, but is unable to ascend. After defeating the Unchained, you receive the glimpse of fallacy. The word fallacy is placed in direct contradiction to the glimpse of truth. A fallacy is a mistaken belief based on an unsound argument. From his dialogue, we know that the old prisoner intended to become a god himself by dethroning the other revered. This was his mistaken belief and ultimately his downfall. But what if he couldn't ascend because he didn't drink the foundling's nectar? If the foundling is a revered, wouldn't he have nectar? Well, this is where it gets interesting. The old prisoner knew what the foundling was and knew he didn't have nectar to give, which is why he didn't think he needed it to ascend. I believe this further supports my idea that tar represents religion and the foundling represents nihilism. Secondly, Sester Janessa constantly entices the foundling to drink her tar. We know Janessa is incapable of interacting with the world from the old prisoner's dialogue, so she's imparting some influence on the foundling whenever she gets him to drink. This is her way of manipulating the real world. She, along with Hadern, seek to guide the foundling and raise it in a way to do their bidding. While Hadern is the foundling's guardian, Sester Janessa is its mother, helping to raise it to bring about the destruction of the other religions. I think this is an interesting twist because it alludes to the darker side of Sester Janessa. It also ties into the meaning of the word foundling. A foundling is an infant abandoned by its parents and raised by others. So I just wanted to clarify, the statements within this video are totally separate from my own beliefs. I'm simply trying to explain what I believe the story is about. I'm not telling anyone to live or to believe a certain way, I'm just trying to convey the deeper subtext within the story of Mortal Shell. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know your thoughts on the theory. I'm definitely not a philosophist, but I hope I managed to put together a cohesive enough story. I feel pretty good about the strength of my theory and feel as if it's supported throughout the main lore in the game. There's certainly more evidence I chose to leave out simply to keep this video more concise. I hopefully managed to keep everyone engaged. As I said in the past, this will be my last video in the series unless the developers decide to add any DLC or something. But I thank you so much for all your support. I didn't think these videos would get any attention because uh, the algorithm is definitely working against me here, but I've been absolutely blown away by the number of kind messages I've gotten with this series. Uh, so if you're a subscriber, stay tuned for a channel update. But for now, uh, thanks for watching. Peace.